Hello, James. So I've been following your work for quite a long time. And just before we get into our conversation, I would love for you to give some context on how you got to where you are today. I know you're a very multifaceted person, <laughs> um, working in podcasts, working for Forbes, and a lot of other things that you've done in the past. Um, so could you please give me maybe like a very brief overview of what you think the most important trait was in getting you to where you are today? I can. And thank you, mate. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and congrats for getting to 20 odd episodes. Like, and I also know how difficult that is. Um, it's a, it's a great question. And like, I, I actually said this on a podcast, I think yesterday that I was recording with someone for my podcast that I think it's a mixture of curiosity. I've always been curious about other things that I could be doing. I was a really distracted medical student. I was a really distracted junior doctor with everything going on. And I always like followed those threads, you know, when you can end up in like a, a hole on Wikipedia because you're like 45 links deep. I'm that sort of person. Like I'm, ten I'm curious. I'm also sort of tenacious with it. But I think what underlies that trait leading to change or leading to whatever your definition of success is, I think is this genuine belief that I've got that my life can be better. I can make that change. This system can improve. And I just have this kind of belief that if it's been done before, it can be done again. If it's been done in a different sector, it can be done again. If someone has improved their life from this position to that, I can do the same. And so that kind of belief that as long as there's a precedent or there's an instruction manual, then I can get it done. And so I think it's the mixture of those things like curiosity, tenacity, and then belief. Um, but yeah, great question. Do you think that curiosity, tenacity, and belief has a dog side as well, that you can almost be too curious to the point where, like you were saying, you get distracted, that it kind of leads you astray off the actual mission and you start going into places that don't yield any results. 100%. And I think it's an absolute balance of that and focus, which is actually going to deliver you, in inverted commas, results. I think, you know, in the company that I run at Somex, like, we have to be curious to some degree we also have to be focused to some degree because if we don't try new platforms if we don't experiment with different products and ways of doing things then we will not innovate but at the same time if all you do is experiment and you don't double down on what's working and you don't retain your focus at key times you're going to go out of business too. So at the end of the day, I think it, yes, you're right. It definitely has a dark side. And there are times individually where I have taken feedback and criticism that I'm a dreamer. I've got too many ideas. I need to actually execute on them. Like all those different things. I've heard that a, like a, a decent amount through my career at one particular point. Um, so like, yeah, it, it's, it's a balance, man. Uh, mm -hmm but striking that balance it's a moving target as well like there are there are certain times where it's really good to experiment there are certain times where it's really important to focus and actually i think part of being a leader a ceo an entrepreneur and, and and leading a team through like for example a really difficult economic time through a really really difficult economic time should you be experimenting with loads of different things or maybe not should you be experimenting with a couple that might work that you've prioritized because of the chance they will work probably and so, you know, it, it's trying to balance all that. Yeah. And I think it's probably easy. Like I'm a, I'm a curious person like yourself and it's probably easy for the two of us to sit here and say like curiosity is a trait that you need to have to essentially build big businesses to lead change at big scale. For someone who's sitting there who feels like they're not curious, like how does someone even find that curiosity in, that, in the first place? Yeah, I think that's about experimenting with lots of different things until you find something that you're willing to read about, watch videos on, read books on, even when you're not, in inverted commas, meant to, so it doesn't feel like work. I, I, talk to, I say this to, I think medical students quite a lot ask a similar question, which is, 
along those lines, but also I don't know what bit of health tech to go into and I don't know how to get into it, for example. And my answer is generally the same that, uh, by the way, N equals one in this study, like you want to get your answers on this from lots of different people. And I'm fully aware that as I, as the years go on, my, my advice gets out of date quite quickly. But I think if you, if you are in that situation and you just think, oh, how can I just get the success in inverted commas? How can I get the job, do the thing? I just want a shortcut to that. I don't think you're going to be as successful or as fulfilled even in a career than the person that, and this is the advice that I tend to give, which is figure out and discover what clinical area really interests you. Then figure out and discover what technology really interests you. And the chances are, there are multiple companies doing that technology in that clinical area and trying to get something done. And then you're interested in both. And then what you can do is once you've Googled it and chat GPT'd it and all these things, you'll end up with knowledge of a few companies in that space, a few startups in that space, a few entrepreneurs in that space, a few think tanks or this or that. Like there'll be lots of different things in and around that you'll end up reading because you genuinely enjoy it. And then and I use this example a lot. Like, let's say you're super into women's health and epigenetics, genomics, that contraception. Then you're like, okay, well, you might want to speak to Elena and Paulina at Dharma Health, for example. And by the time you've read about their competitors and their space and who might acquire them and you know a bit about the products and things that are adjacent, all of a sudden you're, you're so rich with knowledge and information that you're not getting any points than any application for. But you genuinely enjoyed reading about it. And there's people in that space that can then value you because you know things about their space and they're going to give you a shot if you offer your time and all those things. So I think it's that. I, I think really like experimentation will find that curiosity in you. But if you restrict yourself and you're not willing to try many things, then you're not going to strike gold, I don't think. The chances are lower. And if you're optimizing for the result and, and you're super focused on just, I just want a job at a health tech company or I just want this or I just want that, I think yeah. I'd question whether you do actually want that. And maybe that journey of discovery is going to put you on something that you probably do find more curious and you discover that curiosity in you. Yeah. Have you, have you read um, How to Do Great Work by Paul Graham? His new I've not. I've not. So. In that essay, he talks essentially, in, in my opinion, it's the blueprint for anybody who wants to evoke curiosity or go on a journey like that. And he talks about how most of the time people will sit there and say that they want to get to X, Y, Z. However, they don't put the work in to kind of go on that road yeah. of discovery. And I know like if we use the example of med students or anyone in the healthcare space looking to get into health tech, a lot of the time, like you said, people optimize for the result as opposed to optimizing for that journey of discovery. And on the roads to discovery, you might realize that actually, I thought I wanted a job in health tech when I'm actually really interested in marketing. I could probably niche down with my healthcare background to do healthcare marketing, or I can go and work at any other company doing marketing, generally speaking. And I think people don't go on that road of discovery enough to even figure out all of that stuff anyway. Yes. The only thing I'd caveat with is like, I do have empathy for it because at the end of the day, it can feel like sunk cost. It can really feel like, especially early on in that journey of discovery, where you're finding things you don't like, it feels like you've just gone down a cul-de-sac and you've got to reverse back and go down a different one. And then you've got to reverse back and go down a different one. Like, so I can understand the feeling of sunk cost in that scenario, but I would argue it's linear. I would argue you've learned something that you don't like. That's incredibly positive because the next time that comes around, you can say no. A time where you would have said yes and then wasted your time further. So, but I can I, I can understand that. Um, but it's like it, it's it's like if someone had asked me at the age of eighteen, why do you actually want to be a doctor? Like, I honestly don't know what I would have said. Like I genuinely don't. I probably would have given the same answer that I gave in the interviews. Like I like science and I like people and there's good problem solving and that's intellectually stimulating and challenging and I'll learn some stuff. But I didn't. I didn't know any of that. Like I didn't. I didn't actually sit mm. down with a junior doctor and go like, "What's your life like?" 
Like I, I didn't, I, I wasn't informed at all. And I was watching Scrubs last night and um, season nine, like the season after he's left and, and uh, arguably like people say it's like a bad season. I actually didn't mind it. I actually quite enjoyed it. But Dr. Cox in that talks, he, he's talking to the to the the main character, the Lucy character, the, the JD character of the new season. And he, and he says to her like, why do you want to be a doctor? I'm basically going to kick you out of med school if you don't give me a good answer. And he asks all these different people and they just give genuinely real, honest answers for them. And she, she's just trying to do all the cliched answers and blah, blah. She never really figures out like, why does she actually want to be one? And it's just, I, I, I can relate. Like I wasn't actually sure. And I was going down this path of a vocation and a life because it is medicine. I was going down towards this life completely uninformed and sort of riding the wave of pride that I was one which was getting me very far and pushing me through a lot of hard work and hard times and transcending my hunger and my thirst and my tiredness for patience and feeling good about that and there were these good great moments along the way but ultimately towards a life that wasn't for me and that was always going to catch up with me and could I have been more informed yes I could have absolutely been more informed and whose fault is that it's mine there's nobody else that I can blame for that. I was an adult that could have gone and got more information and put me on a path towards a life that was more for me. And so, yeah, you have you have to put the work in and it is on you to, to, to do that discovery. But of course, you're not going to get it right. And don't beat yourself up about that because of course, we all turn around and go back down, the, back to the main road and go down a different cul-de-sac to try and find the answer. But um, yeah. That sounds like a good book, man. Like, put the work in, definitely. It does, it, you're not handed I'm, your purpose, definitely not. It, it is an active process. Yeah, and I think it's something that a lot of the time, if we go back to the thing of sunk costs, people also look at sunk costs in the reverse way to say that I've been in this job or I've been in this degree for X amount of years. So for me to start exploring other things now, even I could hate it as much as possible, but because I've put four years of time into something else, I could not possibly go and start exploring something else. And I think that's where sometimes people need to realize that life is over a lifespan of like 40, 50 years, mm. maybe an extra two years of you exploring something else is probably mm. very insignificant in the grand scheme of things. And on the topic of like exploring curiosity and like just finding out new things and putting the work in, one of the things that I really wanted to discuss with you is this is a, podcast where we focus on health equity of course mm. how we can build solutions for black and brown people to essentially move the needle in healthcare um, mm. and I know you have vast experience in the world of business marketing communications so I wanted us to have a breakdown of how we could essentially build a business focusing on anything to do with health <laughs> equity and I've got a few ideas of areas that we could potentially solve because I do these thought experiments in my head all the time. Mm, mm. Um, but I wanted to find out, do you have any areas that you've seen or examples from startups that maybe you think there is a, a gap there and then <laughs> we can go straight into that and essentially give the listener a blueprint on what to do? It's a, it's, it's a great question. And I do get asked this a lot because of my position in the space, I guess I've always been... I've always been watching over the race with all of the horses in it, all of the startups in it. I've always been watching over the race because I ran accelerators. And then I've now got like a marketing agency that we have multiple clients in multiple spaces. So I've always had this sort of helicopter view of everything going on. And it's funny because what that has given me is actually a great deal of cynicism rather than rather than epic optimism if i had to lean one way my bar for what a good idea actually is is so high and it's funny also because i'm i guess i'm 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 known in the space as like the health tech guy i've got the health tech podcast i've got health tech pigeon i've got a health tech agency to some degree like I'm known as this health tech guy, but I've never actually built a health tech company. I've never raised VC money. I've never built a tech product. I'm sort of hiding in plain sight as the health tech guy that's never actually done any health tech. <laughs> I've sort of talked about mm -hmm. it and I've helped people with NHS access and funding and helping them with a great deal of things like tactically within their companies on product and marketing, obviously massively and communications and that side of things and content. Blah, blah. 
But it's, it's, it's funny, man. Like I, I, I very occasionally I'll have some idea of, Hey, why don't they do this for this or that for that? But I, I would, and it, do you know what? That frustrated me a lot when I was running accelerators because I was looking at the founders that I was supporting. And I was, I was sort of like, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. But back to your point about knowing yourself and what you will find curious and enjoyable and going towards a life you want. The thought now, for me personally, of raising VC money on an idea that might work, but might not, and I might lose all of that institution's money or angel investor's money, all those things. The thought of that, I, I couldn't, I, for where I'm at right now, I just wouldn't like it. I, it would it would weigh on me like a pressure and some extras bootstrapped we haven't taken investment we've just sort of spent less than we earned each month started with one client and now we're at 20 odd and like that's just how it's grown like very organically um as a bootstrap business which of course comes with its own issues like you can't scale that quickly and you're constantly worried about the cash position and people paying you and th there's lots of anxieties that come along with that but yeah i i wouldn't like it i, I genuinely wouldn't but the idea of it is fantastic. The idea of being like, oh, I've just raised 40 million and we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Well, I wouldn't know where the heck to start like with that volume of capital and how to deploy it across like quite mature departments in a bureaucratic company. I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know what I'm doing. Um, and that would frighten me. For some people, that is exhilarating. That is absolutely exhilarating. And again it's knowing who you are and actually going like yeah i don't want to do that so a long-winded answer to your question i don't particularly have any good ideas right now but where i do think about things is i see new technologies come over the horizon like large language models and things like that and i i do think about how they might be used and actually when as soon as chat gpt came out what really hit me like a ton of bricks was like, this can release the admin burden. We don't need to do diagnostics. We don't need to turn it into software as a medical device. Let's just think of it this like really basically and let's think about this listening to what we do, coming up with an action plan, writing a list of tasks, and then an agent model just goes and does those tasks and orders those bloods and does those x-rays. And it just sits in the back and the human is still the human. The interaction is still the interaction. The doctor is still the doctor. But then it's been done. Mm. You know, I sp spoke to, I spoke to um, uh, Dom Pimenta from Tortoise yesterday. Tortoise.ai is their website. They're doing this. Um, Microsoft and Nuance are doing this. And so those ideas come through. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no wildly amazing IP that I'm going to give your listeners right now, mate, <laughs> to go and copy. Um, sadly, I'm not sat on any of those ideas. Yeah, that's. I think it's always interesting, especially like as much as someone might be listening and go like, oh, James didn't come up with an idea there and then. I think it's. it kind of goes back to that thing we were talking about experimentation. Like me and you could sit down and pull out a thousand ideas right now. The only way to validate any of ideas is through the experimentation stage. Now, if we're talking about validating ideas, um, if I just give a random like yep. example of a problem that I've seen, um, non-attendance and mistrust amongst minority communities as our problem. And our goal essentially is how we can engage them better and how we can essentially save hospitals and systems money as a result of this non-attendance. If that is our idea that we're starting with, mm. how do you think we experiment and almost prove that this is even an idea that we need to work on in the first place? Well, the first thing that I would say is you've already started with the problem rather than just a random tech or random, exciting, shiny things. So you've actually started with the problem there, which is fabulous. You also basically delivered a mini business model because you've said who the customer is and you've said the value proposition to the customer, which is that you're going to save them money through reducing uh, non-attendance rates. So actually, even in the presentation of that idea, you've actually gone way further than a lot of ideas that are 
run by me, let's just say. And so ultimately, I think a lot of... <laughs> A lot of people will, will will come to me and say, and often clinicians or junior doctors, medical students will, 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 will come with an idea that benefits them and benefits them as the user. And ultimately, my questions are always the same, which are, what problem does it solve? Whose problem is it? And how are they going to pay for it? That's basically it. And if you can answer those, with one or two words straight away you're winning and you'd be surprised how many startups that are functioning that have raised money can't actually do that by the way um but yeah what problem does it solve whose problem is it and i want and by the way i want a person i want a person at most a department or something for whose problem is it like i really want to that to be narrowed down as much as possible and how are they going to pay for it i.e. what budget is it coming out of? What budget is allocated to that? What capital uh, like is, is the person that you've said whose problem it is? Do they have money? Do they have it freely available? Can they depart with it in a lump sum, in a subscription? In a, so there's lots of facets to that bit. The more detail, the better, but also the more succinct, the better. Um, both, both are simultaneously true. Um, so that's, that's always my opening gambit. And so I do think in the way that you've pre presented that, that we're trying to reduce non-attendance. We're trying to increase trust. And in doing so, we're going to save hospitals money. Well, that's great. Now we just need to figure out how. And mm. I suppose there are a few. So the way I'm thinking about this now, I just go back to first principles. So if I think this out loud, we want to reduce non-attendance. Let's let's tackle that. Let's talk, talk about trust later. But we want to, you, arguably it's the same thing. But we want to reduce mm -hmm. non-attendance. So the problem is people not attending. So in order for someone to attend, what has to happen? So let, I assume we're talking about outpatient appointments. Let's just say we are. So in order for an outpatient attendance to happen, they need to, so the person the patient will need to be delivered the information for when that appointment is when they are delivered that information the person will need to feel that that appointment is valuable enough to attend so that they want to attend now if both of those are true they know when it is it's in the right language the communication it's in the right format, it reaches the right address, it gets there correctly electronically, so the delivery is important. Um, and they feel it's, it's of enough value. So in that, there's, ha in the consultation itself, was the, was the requirement for a reattendance delivered properly? Did they understand it? Um, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So now, so now they're at a point that they want to attend. Next is what happens between them wanting to attend and attending so then it's how do they get to the place is this a virtual appointment could we do virtual appointments it's going to drop this uh, you know drop this non attendance rate increase attendance could is it a physical problem of getting to the hospital um in doing so do they get lost are they you know could we increase communication by delivering instructions to those people to make sure that they had a map of the hospital that they you know, I'm sort of quoting things that Dr. Doctor does here, or certainly did back in the day when I knew them a lot more. Um, these basic things to, to correct non-attendance from a real practical point of view. The other thing, as you say, is you're trying to wrap into that, I suppose, is trust. I think what you've done there, interestingly, there's an assumption. There's an assumption that do not attend is due to lack of trust. And that's interesting in itself, because one thing that we massively need to do whenever we're talking about these things is always ask ourselves that when we answer those questions, whose problem it is, what problem does it solve, how are they going to pay for it? Ask yourself how much of what you've just said is a fact versus an assumption. And anything that is an assumption, test it, like you said before. And so is it mistrust? I'm assuming that's a massive component, at least to part of it, but only to the part of, I suppose, have they received the information correctly? Do they 
trust that they need to come back? Do they trust in the healthcare system? Do they trust in the individual delivering in information? But then what can we do to increase that trust? Well, we can find out exactly what the problem is, like where's that trust going wrong? So we can do some research and analysis of those individuals if we can reach them um, and we can figure out where that gap is, we can then try and address it. But even as I'm talking here, one other thing to think about is you do not want to be too attached to your immediate thought of what the answer should be, the product. And this is another thing that I see loads, which is I've got this idea for this product that's going to be great. And it's like, is it though? Yeah, it is because blah, blah, blah. Is it though? Why? How do you know that? And so your thought and preconceived idea of what you think the product should be, you're never going to have, I don't think, it would be rare, let's say, for you to strike the exact product in the exact way it should be delivered first go, and even that product entirely. You look at someone like Elliot from Infinity Health, the task management and lots of different things that they do. Um, you know, I, I knew Elliot very early on when when it was just, the idea was like a handover app, basically, or, or computer system, basically, or web app or whatever. But like the idea was to tackle handover. But as soon as you, and Elliot talks about this really well, as soon as you start pulling the red thread of handover and you think handover is the problem, you start pulling on handover, you realize that handover is connected to every single task that has ever happened in that hospital in the last 12 hours. And that's actually the problem to solve. It's the capture of the tasks. It's the doing of the task. It's the grouping of the tasks. It's making sure those are done and the efficiency and that information then coming all the way back to handover in the right way and that kind of thing. So you can't be attached to what you think that the, the, the answer should be straight away because in doing this research and analysis, you're going to uncover what the problem actually is. So what's the root cause of lack of trust, for example? Is that a cultural yeah, thing that's, that's deeply rooted? Is that a more practical thing that because of the language that the letter that you receive is written in? It's written too formally. It's written so that there's words that people don't understand. It's written in the wrong language entirely that they've not appreciated that it should be written in Punjabi or a different language. Like, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, that's going to increase trust. And so. They know, they know, they speak it. The doctor spoke it. Why is the letter in English? Like, I don't, I don't trust this. Like, I thought it was going to come from that doctor and that doctor spoke that language. So why is it in English? Like, this might be, this might be fake. This might be someone different. I don't know. Like, th there's so many things that you could uncover, both anecdotally and I suppose at scale with, with evidence that the, these problems are so multifaceted. And shout out to Garlib and what he's doing at Written Medicine, by the way, to combat that exact problem and making sure the patient communication is in the language that they understand. Uh, I'm sure many of your listeners would have heard about the Romanian child that died because their MRI instructions were written in English, not Romanian. And they turned up not nil by mouth twice. And so the MRI was done too late. The child died. These are real problems. And like, yeah. these are, these are all part of this big thing that you've, that you've mentioned, right? Like, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I think it's, it's something that pulling on that red thread is important, which is why, it's important to just not get too attached in the idea stage and actually start getting the ball rolling. I always say, like, I think you learn a lot more um, by just putting an idea out there into the world and trying to fix it while the ship is moving, as opposed to sitting there writing this perfect business plan and how we're going to market it and how we're going to do absolutely everything. Because when you get to the first hurdle, I am 90% sure in most cases that plan is going in the shredder. and. I think most people don't appreciate that. Now, if we've answered this question of what problem does it solve? Whose problem is it? Who's going to pay for it? Um, we've now got to a point where we've got something very basic and we've got these answers. Um, how does someone go about building an MVP? And for those who don't understand, an MVP is a minimum viable product. Mm. This is something which is often described as the most basic version Mm. of your product that you're trying to solve mm. the first thing that i would say the one thing i learned and by the way i ask this question all the time on my podcast because i'm fascinated with how people turn ideas into reality 
absolutely fascinated by it because I think I think that is such a beautiful thing to convert. Like, what what the hell is an idea? Where does an idea come from? Where is it? Where is it? Like, what is it? And then then you imagine something that turns up in the world. I think it's absolutely beautiful. But the first thing that I would say is that in the testing of that MVP, there are many, many, many cases where you don't actually build the MVP. You build something that mimics the MVP. You build something that mimics the technology to see whether it's useful or not. Imagine if you were going to build a box that, in fact, here's, here's a real example from many many years ago a box for a little box the size of like a pint glass that has a camera in it and it's for blind people and blind people know where that box is in their house visually impaired etc um they can put any object any letter in front of that box and it will read out the letter and it will identify the object and say the colors and all these different things real example from many many years ago um it's not very cheap to go and build the box and then see if it's useful. You can survey people to see if it would be useful, but to your point, testing things in the real world is important. So do you go and build the box? Do you not? It depends how expensive it is. If you want a super cheap way of doing it and I'm being facetious, but like you basically have a fake box in someone's house with a person stood next to it and that that is not visually impaired and you and the and the visually impaired person uses it but it's the human that looks at it and answers and then you can analyze how much it's used and that kind of thing and so finding a way and i've seen this done with like many different apps and things like that that claim it's ai or claim it's some technology at the back end but it just goes to a human to solve the problem and the human just pings it back and then they just find out how much it's being used and they find out the types of requests. They find out how useful it actually is. And then they've got more data to be like, okay, there's a decent value proposition here, or we need to change some stuff. Actually, we need different features. It needs to do this rather than this. It needs to do that rather than that. And you've spent no money. The founder has just been sat in someone's house answering questions about objects. It's probably not going to be that, is it? It's probably going to be more the AI pretend technology in the background. But you see, what, you see what I'm saying, right? Like at the end of the day, you can find a way to test the need first. But then, yeah, okay, you need an MVP. Now, let's say it's technology. It might be hardware. It might be software. There are a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, the first one is you have a co-founder that has the ability to build it. That is, I would say, best practice because at the end of the day, that's cheap it's yeah it's cheap you are basically just using someone's time it's your co-founder they've got equity in the business they will do that they also have the ability to know and understand how to build it if they want to instruct others but the point is you build it in-house you have the ability to change it in-house and you've given away equity to do that or you're the cto and you've given away equity to a ceo or whatever like the point is you built it in-house and you're good to go and you can change it and you're you're agile and you're free again what people who are domain experts you might be clinical you might be a physio you might be a nurse you've built you want it you've got this amazing idea and you want to build it you might think hey i can go to a design agency i can go to a tech agency i can go to a dev, dev agency or whatever uh to get this built i'll raise some money and then i'll get it built there are problems with that approach. It has worked. It can work. Of course it can. But there are obviously problems with that approach in that what they build is that initial version, that initial scope, that initial everything. And that's now built for a certain amount of money that you've had to raise money. You've had to give away equity in your company to get this raised. You've then got an MVP built. You still don't have a CTO in-house, but you've given away... 20% of your equity for 150K. You spent all 150K on the platforms. Now you've got a platform, 20% of your company's gone, and now you need to make some changes because you've got some more user feedback. Well, now you need to raise some more money to make those changes, and you see where I'm going. You might hire a dev. Yeah. You, it's doable. Of course it's doable. You can hire then a dev team and you can figure out, figure that way around it. Or if you're raising big, like of course, you know, there's loads of different ways of doing it. Once you're, you know, if you're raising 10 million seed because you've exited four companies before, 
very different scenario. You've got far more capital to play with and all that kind of thing. But for us normal folk who haven't exited for massive companies before and can't raise Elon money, um, then yeah, CTO in-house, give away some equity. You've got a co-founder now, which has many more benefits than just being able to build technology. Um, yeah, that's going to be that's going to be the way to do it. Very practically, how do I find that person is often the next question. Uh, that's tough. Accelerators like Entrepreneur First mm-hmm. will put you in a room with them. Um, I heard yesterday on a, on a podcast that I recorded, someone who went, in fact, it was Dom Pimenta from, uh, from Tortoise said, yeah, EF, have you heard of it? It's like Love Island for entrepreneurs. <laughs> I was like, fantastic. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, more of one thing and not another, but yeah, far more business. But um, yeah, anyway, Entrepreneur First is a good one. Uh, Obviously, you put in a room with a co-founder. They match domain experts with tech experts. It's that. He was matched. Perfect example. He was matched, yesterday's notes in my notebook, with a machine learning engineer who had built AI agents previously. Um, So domain expert who could code and machine learning engineer, all of a sudden you're off to a winner. But or beyond that you've got to be very good at networking but if you're close to university everybody is one email away um and this is the thing that people often feel shy about or don't realize that if you've got a university email my goodness you are at an obscene advantage because you're probably at a good university with some of the tech talent that's going to go on to do fabulous things and probably start their own companies if you weren't going to message them you can find their email Trust me, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you can find the emails of the five best machine learning engineers with an interest in healthcare and health tech. Uh, if you've got a university email and you should absolutely do that, uh, if at least just to chat to them, let alone you might start a company with them. Yeah, and I think it's, it's that thing of you're never too far away from people and people are always too scared to kind of just shoot your shot cold in the dark when... yeah. I've just got used to it now. Like if I want to speak to someone, I'm going to find you on LinkedIn. I will send you the message. The worst thing that's going to happen is my message is going to get aired. But, but there's, get there's, do you know what, mate? There's, there's, sometimes. Matt, there's wisdom in that though. Like there is like you said, get you're used to it now. That's the thing. <laughs> I've I, something that's been living with me at the minute recently is this phrase that, that, happiness is not the absence of problems it's just the ability to deal with them and like that's the thing or living a stress-free life is not the absence of problems it's just the ability to deal with them and i think that's the thing like you can let these things stress you out but if you do them enough you're just used to it like yeah then you might get aired like exactly and you only need the mm. one that doesn't and then you got a conversation and then you only need the three that don't and you got a team <laughs> like or whatever <laughs> but you know, uh, it, yeah, a lot of it's that a numbers game, game at the end of the day as well. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you mentioned something as well. And when you were speaking about building with a design agency or development agency, all of these agencies, which will build your products for you. And when I started out in my journey, that's actually what I did. Mm. Um, and I always say to people, like, if I could go back in time, I would never do that again, simply because of what you said, like, I think at the start, you you think that you're going to get the product right on first hit. And when you go to this agency, there is a massive assumption, which is not spoken about. Of course, they're not going to tell you that because they want more money. Um, but we built the first product. It worked for like two weeks. We got all of this feedback. Then I was like, oh, actually, like, mm. this is not the right thing. And I'd already spent all of the money. I didn't give any equity. Mm. I'd already spent the money. and. I've got this product now, which I'm like, oh, this is version one. But to get, for us to get to version 1.1, 1. 1, like I now need to spend all of that money that I spent all over again. And before you know it, like these figures are totaling up very quickly and you're going nowhere slowly. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was Entrepreneur First and a whole host of other accelerators. I know you've been involved in some of the NHS ones and Digital mm-hmm. Health London. Do you think it's beneficial for someone to approach these accelerator programs just with an idea, maybe nothing else? Or do you think people need to approach these accelerator problems when you have some sort of legs in the sand almost? Yeah, great question. The accelerator landscape is 
getting better at declaring exactly who they're for and what part of your journey you should be at. EF is an early stage pre-idea application almost. I think you I think they do you do tend to go with an idea at least. Um but you don't need to have done anything. For digital.london, you need a product, it needs to be selling in the NHS at least a bit, and they're gonna help you do more. NIA it needs to be pretty good. They're gonna help you scale it nationally. They they're they're in different spots, and I think you know the seed camp and there's others that are more early stage and there are there are venture builders as well that are more like i guess ef you, you might call it you probably call a venture builder um as in you're basically creating a company from scratch within that accelerator or incubator those words often get banded about together um so yeah it it's it's incumbent on you to just do the research and figure out like what stage you are at and applying for the ones that are for you. I think the value of them is is fantastic for some and it's none for others as well. And I think it's also finding out is that accelerator right for you? Is the support that they offer, is what they offer actually going to help you in some way, shape or form? And it doesn't need to be necessarily in sales. It can be in brand. It can be because you want the logo to put on your website, which helps you with sales abroad or whatever. Like, I don't know. But there are lots of ways that you can square that off. Because when you're deciding on an accelerator, I think it is always worth just doing, a, again, first principles exercise of like, what does this accelerator need from me in terms of my time, in terms of my team, in terms of what's it going to take from me and then what's it literally going to give me advice workshops i don't know money uh mentors access introductions what's it literally going to give me versus now if i think about things how can i leverage this to create some value from it in terms of brand and in terms of other things and so yeah, that's the exercise that's worth doing. Um, yeah. And if we've now, like, we've gone on, like, this very quick road from ideation, we spoke about MVPs, accelerators, we spoke about getting a problem and actually knowing who your problem is solving, who's going to pay for it. So fast forward all of this. Now we've got to the point where we're trying to get word out there and we're thinking about this from a marketing, communications, mm. et cetera, perspective. In order for us to market something to minority communities, and the assumption here that we're going to say is a fact, um, just for the purpose of this conversation, yeah. is that they don't trust the current healthcare system. Yeah. Um, how would we go about marketing to that group of people? Um, more specifically, let's say, black men over the age of 50 who don't typically attend um, their GP practice or when they get health care appointments. How would we go about marketing to that group of people so that we can convert them into being able to attend their GP, for instance? Excellent. So the first thing that you want to do, well, the only thing you really need to do here, it's a big ask, but this is why we do it for people. You need a full communications plan. Now, what that means is the first thing that we're going to do, it's an industry term. It's called a messaging house. You can Google it. It's a vision, a mission. So it's shaped like a house. The roof is the vision and the mission. Um, then the sort of body of the house, so the, the key messages. Um, so you're going to have three to five key messages, phrases that are going to broadly cover exactly what your company is and what it does and those key messages can be a few different things like what do you consider key about the company is it the strength of the founding team is it the very specific problem that you solve is it there's lots of different things is it part is it your val is it a value or values that you hold is it so what makes up your company what are the key if you had to say five things on a podcast about your company, what would those five things be? Is it your differentiators from your competitors? Is it a particular feature or phrase that describes all of your features or whatever? So you're going to def define your key messages and those are going to be, 
the things that are going to be repeated again and again and again because they're going to define you. And with that repetition, you're going to get consistency of brand. And those are really, really, really important to define. And underneath those key, those key messages are proof points. So data, facts that define, that, that, sorry, that um, make those key messages defensible. So if you are saying, if one of your key messages is no one else on earth can build this, that might be a key message. Your proof points would be your team, exactly what their qualifications and expertise and experience is, and other things that define exactly why no one else on earth can build this like we're going to build it or whatever. Um, so yeah, you want to define all your key messages, all your proof points. And now we have the communications blueprint of exactly how we're talking about things. But what you want to do is map your audiences next. Do what's called an audience map. So I love how specific you've been on your audience there. Black men over 50 don't typically attend uh, healthcare appointments. Perfect. That's one audience. But there are many audiences that you care about. Investors. Uh, black women over 50 who are in those families have a role here too. Um, there are a lot, like there are, there are so many different audiences um, that if I pushed you on this problem, like the hospitals, the, so the customers, the users, the this, that, the other, like the potential partners, anyone that might be useful to your company, we're going to map in this audience map. And in the next column, we're going to do a value proposition. So what is the value proposition of this company to that group? And that ideally would be like a really punchy one sentence version as well as like a built out version of all of the bits of value that we can give to that audience that this company can give to that audience next which key messages are most appropriate to that audience so from the message from the messaging exercise we've just done we've got three to five key messages which key messages are appropriate for which audience and then crucially where do they absorb information so from a content perspective and from a PR perspective. So what do they watch? What do they read? What do they listen to? So where do they absorb information? <clears throat> so for black men over 50 that don't typically attend, um, we've now got the exact value proposition to them. We've got all we've got the key messages that are most appropriate to them, which are numbers one and three, and therefore all the proof points of those key messages that are most relevant to them. And we know exactly where they absorb information. So we know where to put that info. We know exactly where to put the value proposition and the, that key message information. Um, next, the artistic bit comes in, a content plan and a PR plan. And this is what we do for people. So this whole exercise, what we do for people. So we're now going to think about, let's say we're playing here from a con from a content perspective, we're playing on Instagram and we're playing on TikTok. And from um for for that audience, for your B2B audiences, like for the for the customers of this, we're gonna be playing on LinkedIn and other different places. Uh from a PR perspective, there we identify 65 different publications and podcasts. Uh and the reason we split those two, by the way, is that content is owned media. And PR is earned media. So content are the channels you own yourself and that you have full control over. PR is getting you in other people's publications and build your credibility and audience size because you get more people come to you that way. So we're going to build out a few content pillars that tell the stories we want to tell that cover all that stuff in that line we mentioned. Um, we're going to, it might be, I don't know, like some case study stuff. It might be some walkthrough day in the life of, it might be this, it might be that, it might be some killer statistics in infographic form. It'll be a, we'll, we'll, develop, we'll think of a few different content pillars that are going to work. Um, and we might structure that into ongoing content streams. You might, it, we might structure that into campaigns. It depends how we're, how we're feeling about these different things, but we'll do that for content. We'll do that for PR. And then we go and execute it. So as you can see, it's like, it's data driven in terms of like the way that we do it. We're not just shooting in the dark as to like, oh yeah, we'll just stick a few of these, we'll, we'll put these things on this platform and, see, and like, we'll see how it works and blah, blah, blah. 
like it's all completely data driven as to how we do it but then it is artistic in actually the delivery of it like the lens that all that is put through is based on our knowledge of what happens on those platforms it's all contextualized per platforms it's a central content plan that's contextualized per platform like what goes out on youtube's different to what goes out on linkedin etc etc but it's a central content plan for that consistency all based on that messaging all based on that audience map all based on that theory um and then yeah it's not for me to say what black men over 50 that don't typically attend um are gonna like are gonna listen to are gonna want to watch and see and all that stuff but that exercise that we do with you and we will go into communities to find this information if we don't know the value proposition of those audiences if we don't know um which key messages are, are going to resonate or if we haven't written those key messages in the right way to resonate we're going to find that information from these communities and we're going to set things up so that we access these communities to find that information so that we're acting on the right information and then, of course, we can do testing. Of course, we can then test that with focus groups and bits and bobs to that community to see whether that creative is going to hit. Um, so, yeah, broadly, man, that's the plan. Um, that's what we do for people. And the whole plan, I think it goes back to probably if I was listening to this episode, I would say the main takeaway is you just have to be on a constant journey of trial and error and totally you figure out what works. Because 100%. even with that content plan, all of that is great, but we might come up with the wrong key messages or um, we might think that we're going to find black men over the age of 50 on Instagram, for instance. But what we actually find is their children. Yep. And then they convey that information back to their parents who are, I don't know, on WhatsApp group chats. And we mm. didn't even consider that in the start. Um, so it's just a constant, constant, constant game it of is. trial and error. It is. And yeah, you just have to be the person to to want to or you have to be the person who is going to be committed at knowing that that trial and error doesn't happen overnight you just have to keep chipping away and keep chipping away and keep chipping away i see this with our clients and i see it even with ourselves mate like with with some x more broadly like it's like there are so many moving targets all the time if you just think like oh i want to keep my team happy i just need to do these five things and it's going to keep my team happy well, what they want changes. Uh, some like mm. at one point they 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 want Fridays off, so we move to nine day fortnight. But actually, then they want more money to start a family, or they want this, or they want that. Like some want day off, some want the pay rise, some want this, some want that. Even that changes. That will change like month to month, year to the year to year. So you've got to constantly, constantly be iterating and learning about your team and knowing them and all that sort of things. It's the same with the clients and how we structure our um retainers and like all that sort of stuff because new platforms come up tiktok emerges um on, in the b2c space or i don't know like the linkedin algorithm doesn't work as well or external links for linkedin are getting nerfed and so all of a sudden you can't like put youtube links because literally they've nerfed the whole thing so they don't want anyone going to youtube and so like oh, okay now we need to Every, the, there is so much iteration constantly but even like you as an entrepreneur like what do i actually want that's changing as well like, what do I want Somex to be? What, what what do I want my role to be? Like, what's happiness for me? Like, what's going on in my life? Like, ha having to, you, in this whole thing is a balance all the time. And it's that thing of not judging yourself for changing your mind. The ability to change your mind is an absolute superpower. And I've said this on podcasts before, but like, people in my team must get so frustrated because I will just learn new information and change my mind like so unbelievably quickly and just like without remorse. I could show more remorse, but like th that gives us this, this superpower of like, oh yeah, we did say that thing. We lent so heavily into it. I've learned new information and I was wrong. So I'm now just going to change my mind. So like, but and I, I think that's the way to do it. Like it has to be, man. If, like if you can't. You have to learn new information and use that new information as a way of essentially moving forward. We're back, we're back to sunk cost, aren't we? We're back. We're back to sunk cost. It's like, yeah. Is it? It's. It's not. It. It is a fallacy. We have gone forwards. We've learned that we that thing doesn't work. We don't like that thing. We're not good at that thing. That thing is not liked by clients we've learned that we've gone forwards and so yeah moving targets man like all this stuff and you're absolutely right like you've got to constantly be listening constantly be watching constantly be learning and 
it's so fluid. It feels so fluid all the time. And sometimes it is just a case of like, you know, if you're caught under a wave, if you're like surfing or bodyboarding or whatever, and you're caught and, you've, and you're told to just like, let it take you just <laughs> like, there's no mm. point resisting it. Sometimes it's that as well. Like some of these punches, you've just got to roll with, like, it is what it is. It's going to be a bad day. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Um, we'll learn mm. from it. We'll come in tomorrow and I we'll see what most, happens. Most, Can't be perfect all the time. Yeah, I think most people who are new to the space or even like, when people ask me for advice in just the world of business, entrepreneurship and health tech more specifically, I think most people think that this stuff is maybe like a year journey or like six months and you'll be doing some great things. And I think most people need to acknowledge like the people who get really, really lucky in this space probably do it in five years. And for the average person, it's probably a 10 year journey, maybe yeah. even longer. Yeah. So when you're, at the start, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a very long-term play. And if you yeah. cannot play long-term games, then maybe this is not the game that you should be playing. Back to knowing yourself and what you and actually enjoy. One of, hundred percent. One of the closing traditions that I have on this podcast is I always ask people, how would you improve healthcare for your community? But I think this conversation today has been slightly different. So I'm going to change the question just for this episode. And I think, one thing that has been on my mind for a very long time, and I would say I'm still figuring out the answer to this problem. So I, I don't even know the answer. I've got a few ideas, but the question is, do you think the health equity market is too small? So by nature of that market being too small, do you think every innovation in this space has to position itself as a form of charity work as opposed to a business case? No. I don't. Um, I can perhaps understand why people might say that. I don't know, man. Like it, it's it's funny because you asked that question, and as you know, I'm I'm mixed race. My dad is from Mauritius, which makes him African. I think he's descendancy is from india pakistan like asia region but um so that i get ang i get flashes of like anger hearing things like that because the the term ethnic minority is only a term when you're perceiving a very small geographic part of the world like if your perception is global, there is no such thing, arguably. Like, I, and, and so when it comes to improving the lives of, <sighs> let's call them minority group. I mean, you can see, you can see that this is like affecting me, right? I'm trying to get, a, trying to get a proper answer out here. Like, the, mm. the market's not too small. Let's just, let's just bin that immediately. The business models need to be innovative. Like the entrepreneurs need, we we need to find a way. Like that's just it. We need we need to find a way. But you can't tell me that making a pulse oximeter that works on black people doesn't have a big market. Like you're joking. Like that's absolute nonsense. You like that that's 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 yeah. that's actually ludicrous, right? Like what you're saying is the countries that can afford such a thing there might not be a business model because they can't afford, well, well, let's just change the goalpost to make it afford, like globally. Like, uh, yeah, I, 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 sh I struggle with that, man, because like it, if it gets me like emotionally, I guess. Um, but no, I, I don't, I don't think the market's too small. And if I have to work hard to come up with a proper answer here, um, I think it's about lining up the incentives to make what is such an obvious win work. I think it's that. Amazing. I, I don't want to add anything extra to that answer. Um, and I want to leave our listeners with that specific point, because that's probably something that I have taken a very long time to learn that for you to win in this space, you have to be able to line up the incentives to every single stakeholder at the table. And that's 
simply the answer. Agree. But thank you so much for thank you so much for being a guest today on our podcast, James. And to all of our listeners, we will be back with another episode at the same time next week. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man.